Hello, and welcome to today's first Business Skills webinar for 2015, Making Money with Online Events. Uh, my name is Michael Bunker, and today I will be interviewing Sarah Gonzalez. We will be discussing how we can engage and increase revenue opportunities through webinars and webcasts. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm very good. Okay, can you give us a brief overview as to what our audience can expect today? Yeah, so I just really want to set the agenda quickly um, based on what you all registered for um, and give you an overview of what we'll be delving into over the next 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, firstly, I just want to define online events as webinars and webcasts and make sure every single person is across the differences between them and how they can be used when it comes to making money from them. And then really go into the three main ways that we consider making money from online events. So that's sponsorship, lead generation, and paid versus unpaid. So chances are everyone who is on this webinar today has attended an event that has been sponsored, has been charged, or maybe is a lead generation event. So I really encourage you all to get involved in the discussion and share your experiences to the chat box and share any tips that maybe you have to provide us with as well. Um, what I also want to do is I just want to, you've had a chance to see us now, hi, uh, <laughs> I just want to get Michael to turn the webcams yes. off um, because then we can focus on the content and there may be some people who may experience some bandwidth issues in other locations. So thank you for that Michael um, and don't be alarmed, um, the webcams have been turned off so it's not your computer. So, online events, just a brief um, overview because I don't want to bore anyone with what a webinar is or anything too um, simple, but a webinar essentially is what we're on now. Okay, so just on that, um, so yeah, the webinars, um, like Adam said there, it's not really new. They have been around for a long time. The PowerPoint is the main focus. Um, a webcast is something a little bit different now. So a webcast is really high definition, and what it is, it allows your online viewers, think of TV on the internet, if you like, where it's not really a PowerPoint, it's more about the video, it's more about a Today Show style format, and a lot of people are now turning to those to mix up their online events and to give their people something a little bit different. Um, it is important to note that webinars and webcasts can be interchangeable, so some of our customers uh, may have a 12-month professional development program, and they will offer maybe eight events via webinar, and there may be the other four through a webcast, for example. Um, maybe you have your annual conference and that's also a way that you can generate revenue through online events. So you might use a webcast to stream that live event online to your audience as well. So just a few different um, little differences there with uh, webinars and webcasts, Michael, just to put everything into perspective as well and to understand that they can be used interchangeable. Nice. Okay, so let's get into the first way to make money from online events, sponsorship. We hear a lot of clients who want to do this, but I think many don't know how. Can you explain a bit of how the sponsorship works in an online environment? Yeah, absolutely. So as many of you may know, sponsorship is working with other organizations that are really similar or they have an aligned goal or vision or purpose to you to support a particular event. So in most cases, it's usually um, for a cash reimbursement, um, yep. especially with online events, um, or sometimes it's an in-kind fee paid for exposure and sometimes lead generation. Um, so like offline sponsorship, obviously it's important to choose an organization that's aligned with what you're doing. But I think the biggest thing with online sponsorship to remember is that your content does live on a lot longer than an offline event. So if you are hosting an event and you're looking to get it sponsored, it's important that you really, really convey the benefit of the content living before, during, and after your online event as well. Um, and with that, with an online event, when you are hosting recordings online and you do have a sponsor that's actually paying you money to support this event, you can use their logo goes online and their websites and their campaigns and expose them for maybe 12 to 18 months is the average that online content actually lives on once it's hosted. So you can change up links, you can change up any call to actions that they have as well. Nice. And obviously this is also going to be a higher return investment for not only yourself but also for the sponsors as well. Um, so that's just an idea of the benefits of online sponsorship. You get all the same benefits as yep. you do with offline but it's more than just having a banner and it's more than just having a logo. It's about um, p being able to direct people to different pages and different websites and different campaigns for maybe 12 to 18 months after your event has been held as well. I think it's kind of funny that so many people put the emphasis on the physical event and getting sponsorship for that one day and yeah. not realizing that if you sponsor the digital event, it lives for the life of the content. Exactly. And some people, if you know they've got enough money, they might actually sponsor both and they might yeah. actually get the best of both worlds. 
Nice. Okay, I want to get into sponsorship now, but first I want to get some of your audience opinions. So, Yanine, can I get you to launch our poll, please? Cool. So have you secured sponsorship for your organization in the past 12 months? So we're going to leave this poll up for a little bit just so we can gauge some responses. I can see now a lot of people are saying yes, but now it's starting to change. We do love an interactive poll. You can see it all changing yeah. as it happens. And I'd love to get um, a little bit more insights into your experiences by using the text box if that's possible. So just type in there, maybe it worked for you, maybe it didn't. Was it online sponsorship and maybe you just delved into it and decided to wing it and maybe it did work for you? Be, be free to share that with us as well. Um, I think it's important that we build a community with these types of things um, and get as much conversation flowing. Um, and I can see around 52% have actually secured sponsorship for their organisation in the past 12 months, which is great. Nice. Okay, so I guess we'll, we'll close the poll now. Perfect. And let's go on to the next slide. How it works, sponsorship. So, Sarah? Yeah, um, and I've just seen Karen say more seems to be in kind and not as a cash sponsorship, which I think is interesting because, to be honest, most of the sponsorship we see with online events seems to be cash. Um, a lot of our partners, and just I'm not going to put anything out there um, that everyone you know must yeah. sort of aim for, but usually around the $500 to $1,000 mark, we see people actually getting their online events sponsored for. Some of them I have seen go up to three or $4,000, uh, but that's for high-profile speakers. Yeah. Um, it's for international speakers who are coming in from the States as well and that is for content that is going to live on for a long time and with maybe 200 plus attendees as well. So just maybe keep that in mind as we go through and talk about more about sponsorship. I will have to say, yeah, for one of my customers, they've done it very well. They get their whole entire digital event sponsored by one person. Mm -hmm. So they don't spend any money on it every yeah. year for their conference. You're getting and free online events. They're getting a free online event every year. But that sponsor gets so much out of it because they've done a really great strategy around it. So if you can prove the value, you can technically get your event for free. Yeah, exactly. So, how it works. Yes, so like I said, it's a little bit different than a live event where you do just have a banner app at your conference. Um, you've actually got landing pages where you collect registrations, as you would have done to register for this event, and then you've got all your email invitations as well which go out, so your invitation, your confirmation, your reminder, and having that all redirected to somewhere. Um, so obviously using logos is important, but because it's online, it's so much easier to include links that go to other online pages that your sponsors can actually have on there as well. Um, and having that ability to capture data in that live environment from people, not just about how you can tailor your event, but also what your sponsors want. So these people are registering for your online event. They're in the moment as they really want to attend. Maybe ask your sponsors if they want to ask one or two questions about your audience to help them out, to make, them, to make this event more valuable to them as well. Um, and also email invitations are important. Um, you may have seen through us, um, we haven't, we don't use them as a sponsor, but it can be seen as the same thing, our charity spotlight. So we do a charity spotlight every quarter where we highlight three charities. We have that on our landing pages, we have it on our submit pages, we have it on our email invitations. And then once you actually come into the platform, you can actually see that in there as well. So it's consistent throughout the entire thing. And those links go back to these charities' websites and to their Facebook pages. And like I said, much more more than just having a banner at a live event. Nice. Okay, so we're going to go into some examples now, right? Yeah, and I just want to show you how this can be done um, because ADMA, the Association for Data-Driven Marketing and Advertising, they're a partner and these guys do it really well and they actually have a lot of international speakers. So I'm just going to get my little tool here to show you. Obviously they have logos, so you can see down here there's a logo of who it was sponsored by there, and Infocentric. But what they also do, they also use the actual landing page to replicate their website on the background. So sometimes I think if you have logos all over the page it looks a bit salesy when you are doing sponsorship, um, but, but the fact that they have made it look very similar to their web page, I think it just makes it look a little bit more credible. That's an extension of their brand. Yeah, exactly. Um, and these links for Intro Infocentric, they actually go back to the campaign that Infocentric are running now. So it's not going back to their website, it's actually going back to something that's relevant for Adma's audience here. So whether it's a special offer, whether it's a dedicated page that says, um, you know, here are five things why you should buy from us or five reasons why we're going to provide you with um, some great content and you know make everything great. Um, but another thing which is important is privacy when it comes to online events and sponsors. Um, so on the right hand side you've got the register bottom on the 
down here. And then there you've got, yes, I accept the terms and conditions, but underneath the terms and conditions are there. Um, privacy laws have changed and a lot of the times sponsors will come into these sort of agreements and say, well, if I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars to sponsor your online event, I want to make sure that I can capture this data afterwards. So how can I do that? So ADMA have something here which states, by registering for this event, you give permission for ABC company to contact you afterwards or something similar to that as well. Um, so that's just an example of how landing pages work when you're capturing that information. Nice. Okay, so the submit button there, that's what takes you to the redirection, the re uh, redirect page. Yes. So. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Um, so I think this is really underutilized um, in live in live face to face sponsorship opportunities, but really mu much more so in the online environment. So when someone clicks on submit, you then have them in the palm of your hands when they click to go somewhere else. So why not utilize these pages to actually showcase your sponsors here as well? So this is an example of the charity spotlight, which is different, but this is another page that you're redirecting all those registrants to. Um, um, and I think it's important to really think about registrants as well as attendees because yep. I think um, most people are caught on to the fact now that attendance rates are dropping within online events and we probably see around a 40% attendance rate on most online events, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it's important to capture as much from your registrants and to expose your sponsors to your registrants even more so than what it is for your live attendees as well. So using that submit button to then redirect people to other pages. And just another way to make money here, even if you aren't gaining sponsorship, if you're just running an online event, use that redirect page to maybe showcase other events that you have coming up. Maybe you're running a three-month webinar series and you want people to register for one and then view another one. Or maybe you've got an annual conference coming up. So when people click on submit, they can then actually be redirected to your annual conference page and you can then entice them to join it that way as well. So yeah. just really thinking about these pages um, is, I think, really important. Well, you've got them there already, so you might want to use them. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you've mentioned in the uh, you mentioned the platform. How can the yes. platform be used for sponsors? Okay, so um, the platform is obviously important because it's for people who join, um, and it's much more than just a PowerPoint presentation with a logo on it. Um, one of the important things to remember is that your PowerPoint presentations can have links embedded in them in most platforms. Um, so that means this little icon here, the logo for Infocentric, that can actually redirect if you want it to to something else. Um, you also have a thing called a documents folder um, which is located on the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, down there. And so what you can do, you can put additional information in there about your sponsors as well. So just like a live event or a live conference, you may have those little satchel bags where it has sponsors information. You can do exactly the same within here if you wanted to as well. Um, the branding and the colour of your platform. So a lot of platforms allow you to brand. So top left hand corner, we have a red back logo there mm -hmm. um, with some managed events or managed webinar solutions. You can actually change that and you can actually change the whole colour of your platform. So we could make this blue if we wanted to, just so it's a little bit more subtle, but it's actually reinforcing maybe your sponsor's brand as well. Um, using the video player, which I think um, I saw someone do last year, and I think you saw it too, Michael, and I thought it was excellent. Um, what they did at the beginning of the webinar, um, just say the webinar started at 11 o'clock, they launched a video, which is actually streamed from YouTube within the platform, and it was a 30-second video from their sponsor. And it was actually a really funny video. Um, it really showcased their brand. It wasn't salesy. It was nothing like that. It was almost like a note from our sponsor, but thank you for joining. Here's who sponsored the event. And I think people are used to that sort of stuff now anyway. And they if are. it's short and snappy. Yeah, it's the same as if you go to YouTube nowadays and you have an ad roller yeah. for the first 15 seconds. But having a non-salesy sponsorship ad at the beginning was quite a powerful tool. And a lot of people did end up clicking on that video. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, and it sort of just um, breaks the ice, I think, as well, before an online event. I think, you know, if online events are something relatively new to you, um, you know, people might be a little bit scared to join and they don't know what to expect, but playing a video at the beginning sort of relaxes people, puts them at ease, and yeah, I think it's a nice way to start things. Um, In-room surveys as well, so getting information about your sponsors. So at the end of the event, asking people feedback on the actual event, but then also saying, do you want to be contacted or do you want to yeah. opt in for our sponsors, um, and that obviously is powerful, especially due to the privacy laws that have come into play most recently. Yeah, because this is an example of the platform, correct? The one we're in right now. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Cool. 
OK, this is all well and good, but how do sponsors, sponsors get on board? OK, yeah. So um, I think everyone, depending on the industry and depending what sort of sponsors you're going after, it's going to be different. But I think this is quite generic, um, and I think we see this quite a lot from the sponsor and the like as, as marketing here at Redback, we obviously get people come to us a lot of the times and if we don't see a lot of these things on here to us, it's like, okay, well, what's in it for me? Where's the value? So this is coming from both sides of the coin. Um, obviously, having a clear proposal and prospectus to give people and outlining exactly what is going to be given to them. And because you have online events and because you can take snapshots on your computer and put a picture in there, you can show them examples of what it's going to look like for them. Yep. Um, and your online event provider will be able to give you examples because they've done it all in the past. Um, so you can say, okay, on the landing page, we can brand it like this and you can put your logo here in these dimensions and with this and with that. Um, so really important to get that when you talk about the invitations, the registrations and also the, um, the recordings. Providing um, estimated hits and return on investment. So I think this is great and another thing that's really underutilized. So on your registration pages, your landing pages where people register, you should be able to convert um, to measure the conversion, sorry, on that. So you can then say to your sponsor, you know, we had 500 people come to this page and 250 actually registered for the event, got redirected to your submit page and then actually um, were able to see you afterwards. Or you could actually say, oh, we had 500 people come to this page and 20 people clicked directly on your link to go to your offer yep. or something like that as well. So once you have that information built up, um, you can actually estimate that and say, okay, the last time we did this, this is the, this is what we got in return. This kind of ties into uh, Mitchell's question. So Mitchell typed in the chat box, how do you qualify the figure associated with the value of the access to digital channels, social media mm. websites? So with this providing estimates and hits to ROI, you can follow the whole trail of where your people are coming from for your event, and especially with these landing pages and redirecting pages, you can see if they've clicked through to special offers or anything, so then you can put a percentage of click-throughs through it that can mm. equal a value if they ended up buying. And Sarah will be going into this a little bit later on with a yep. whole relationship of the sale. Yeah, and I think um, another thing is to be creative and think about not just having a logo on there. I think that's one of the worst things that you can do to go to someone and say, okay, I want you to sponsor my event and pay this much money and I'm going to put your logo on our webinar. Yeah. And it's a bit like, okay, well, so what, who cares? Um, but, you know, it is and I think more and more people are getting so, they're getting bombarded with this sort of stuff now and you need to find a way to stand out and last year we had um, a client of ours and he actually had two sponsors online and they both gave away something. It was around the Christmas period. One of them gave away a 500 voucher to the next workshop or something like that um, and it doesn't need to be salesy in the way that you do it. I think it just needs to be, um, it just needs to be relevant and it really needs to provide value to someone. Um, and then in terms of mistakes as well, I think a big thing is when you are going out there to gain sponsorship, a lot of people send out sponsorship proposals and they have it done and it's great and they don't follow up with people. And I know that because people don't follow up with me yep. a lot of the time. Um, and like I said, it's not all about the logo. I think you really need to be creative and strategic. Um, and do some research online and see what other people are doing. Um, what's different about your offering and how will you measure that? I think going to someone with a proposal and showing them how you're going to measure this and how it's going to be of value, I think that's really important when it comes to gaining sponsorship. Nice. Okay, so going into webinars and let's go into lead generation. These yep. webinars seem to be very popular in the States. What are they all about? Okay, so another way of making money with online events is lead generation. So if anyone has any more questions about sponsorship, let me know. Um, but these three ways of making events all sort of tie in together, mm -hmm. I think you'll find. And lead generation isn't just about corporates and marketing and sales teams. Um, a lot of it can be actually tailored to not-for-profits and membership, um, whether it's membership engagement or also gaining extra members um, and getting them on board. So essentially, lead generation um, it's they work and they're so common in the States and I don't really think they've taken off here but it's really about exposing your product or service through an online event, gaining that information, providing educational and inspiring content and then nurturing those leads as they come through and then passing them on to your sales team yep. or your membership teams to follow up. Um, this is obviously going to increase your online presence but it's also going to generate leads for you, hence why they're called lead generation events. So how does this lead generation process work? Yes, well, so like I said, you collect registrations through landing pages which were just similar to what we saw in the past. You have presenters online that provide completely educational content. So 
it's very important that these events aren't selling whatsoever. So you might have um, someone on content marketing, for an example, is a great way to do this. So you might be the gardening association and you actually hold an event with this um, stellar gardener who's an international speaker and he's developed all this research on how to grow these flowers, which are really, really rare because obviously he's amazing um, and he hops online and he wants to generate leads from this and he wants people to buy his research that's his end goal yep. but he gets online and he gives little snippets into the research that he's conducted and he talks about how good it is and he gives people something of value and maybe he gives people half of the research afterwards but his end goal is to either get people to buy his entire research yep. or to get people to maybe sign up to his newsletter or something like that that would be an example of a lead generation event from the from the the corporate side of things but another good example is who you worked with last year Michael um, from the membership side of things the legal yeah. organization so yeah I worked with a very large legal organization who was specializing in physical events and they were then trying to break into the online event and do hybrid events and for them to get their memberships even use of the technology or even to try it for the first time they gave away one free CBD point and the fact that these CBD points cost these people quite a lot of money mm. they ended up getting a thousand people online yeah. which automatically in introduced their new product line to a thousand people which automatically became a new revenue stream for them mm. and because it was oh, with a talk with a speaker who was of um widely acclaimed mm -hmm. and everyone liked him and he knew it was going to be engaging they got so many more people on there but it wasn't about selling mm. the platform or what they were trying to do it was about giving them away the point to introduce them to something so now they wouldn't be apprehensive of trying it and spending the money the next time and it worked really well yeah, and I think, like I said, it's about giving a little to get a lot more in return with Legion events, but they have to be educational. Um, you have to be able to analyse this data and nurture the behaviour that comes through. Yep. So, for example, big data is just bombarding us all right now, and I'm a little bit over here on it, to be honest. Um, but what actually happens is with online events, you can report on everything. Um, and the biggest thing you can report on is who attended, how long they attended for, what their behaviour was, did they answer polls, did they ask questions, then what are you going to do with that information. Yep. So as a marketer who is looking to generate leads from online events, that's incredibly important because you can then use that to nurture them afterwards and then eventually get them into the buying cycle. Um, but I think the biggest thing with this is understanding that it does involve the support of your sales team as well um, and making sure that as an organisation you are aligned um, in getting this to happen. Um, and another thing as well, just to put things into perspective with this before we go into the buying cycle is, um, you know, people in general when it comes to online events, they're going to buy, you know, 25% of them are going to buy within the zero to six months period. Long term, 50% of them are going to buy within the six to 24 months period and 25% of them won't even buy, they're just going to come online to get your educational content and some insights. So this is where nurturing really comes into it, which we're going to go into. Um, but just some extra tips for lead gen always offer them for free. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen or seen any research where lead generation events have been actually paid for events um, because in the end they are revenue generating opportunities but just in a different way. Um, send dedicated emails to these events, don't be ashamed to, um, don't hide them in newsletters or hide them on your events page, make a big deal of them and really show the value. Um, educate and don't sell, I think we've just covered that off. And scoring as well, so scoring is a way um, that also comes into the nurturing process. So I might say um, I'm holding a webinar and if you register for my webinar you're going to get 10 points. If you join my webinar you're going to get another 20 points so you get up to 30 points and then if you actually complete the survey and watch the recording I'll give you another 10 points. So that actually accumulates over time but I'm not going to then put you into a nurturing cycle or contact you straight away until you get to maybe 200 points because I want to make sure that you're really exposed to what I'm doing and you're really interested in it and that I'm just not going to annoy you every time I call you. So that's a scoring option there. Um, there are platforms to do it but you can actually do it manually as well if you are just starting out. Nice. And offer content, offer people something for free and consider their behaviour. So they don't just say, okay, this person attended, so they must be really interested. If they attended, they could have been looking at emails for 20% of the time, you don't know that. Whereas if they're participating in polls and they're chatting with people and they're getting really involved, obviously they're you know a little bit more engaged in what you're doing. Um, get the feedback from people online um, and also think about privacy as well, which is where these feedback options and these surveys allow other people to to opt in to what you're doing. 
um, and then measure the conversions like we said with those landing pages um, and always follow up with people with these lead generation events within 48 hours. Don't leave it too long otherwise they will actually go cold. Um, so just a few tips there in terms of lead generation events if you are considering running them. Nice. Okay. Well, we talked about the buying cycle before, but talk to us about this relationship journey. Okay. So the buyer's journey, and I don't want anyone to get scared off by this. Um, this is just an example of how a nurturing campaign would work and how we do it here. And this is just a visual representation of how you can see when someone registers for something, so many behaviors they can take and how you can actually base what you do on those behaviours. So that's just so you guys can see it visually in case it is something, but I want to just talk through it slowly and how it would work for a webinar. So someone registers for a webinar, they might attend the webinar. Okay, maybe they don't attend the webinar. So you can see you've got two options here. If they attend the webinar, you might send them a recording and a piece of content over a two-week period. And if they don't attend, you might also send them the recording, but you might send them a survey link as well and maybe some additional content. And maybe you do that in, say, a four-week period, depending on your audience, because they haven't attended. Maybe it's not of urgency to them, but you still want to be able to keep in touch with them. Then you might say um, if they did open that email that you sent them, with the recorded and they attended, you might send them another email and that might be a membership offer saying, you know, 25% off membership this time around. And then if they open that email, then you might actually pass it on to your membership officer team or something like that and say, hey, I noticed you watched this online event. Are you interested in the content we have to offer or do you want to be put on our database so we can, you know, send you more inspiring content? And you're always going to be in front of mind with them then. Um, you've also got the other option where they're not necessarily opening your emails and maybe they need to be touched in a different way. Maybe it's not all about the online experience for them. So maybe you want to offer them complimentary access to a live event and maybe you want to get them on board then. So they might start online in this buying cycle, but in the end, you know, they might get halfway through and you might say, okay, well, this person isn't really responding to this. Maybe they're more of a touchy-feely person. They want to meet us face-to-face -face or something like that. Um, I think the biggest thing here, Michael, is seeing it like a relationship and I think yeah. you don't go into something and on the first date propose to someone without knowing what you're getting yourself into. You, you're you almost like nurturing and you're wooing people, um, whether you are in a corporate environment, whether you are in a not-for-profit environment and I think every audience needs to be nurtured no matter what sort of industry you're in. Nice. And this t ties back to your whole sales needs to be aligned with marketing as well. Yeah. Because you don't want them contacting them well and truly before they've reached the score or at the right point of the yeah, cycle. Yeah, exactly. So that's just a little bit about um, lead generation. Nice. Okay. So this does this work? Where's the proof? Okay. So uh, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview as to how it has worked for us here at Redback. So in 2014, we ran 20 webinars and we had over 1,600 registrations um, and our landing pages attracted a 42.5% conversion rate. Now, if you have a landing page where people register, so that means people come to your landing page out of everyone who comes versus registers, we had 42.5. It took a while to get there though because industry average according to HubSpot is 5 to 15% as well. So really important for you to work on those landing pages, making sure they're accessible by mobile devices and that sort of thing. And then like I said, using your submit pages for other things as well. Um, and just on that, um, the lead generations we ran from the period of end of financial year 2013 to 2014 actually generated 18% of marketing revenue for us. So quite a big chunk of revenue that was generated from marketing came from online lead generation. So Nicely done. that's quite a good stat to go by. Um, An engagement rate we measured as well. So you know how I just spoke about the scoring just then? Um, we said, you know, we want our average engagement rate for everyone who's attended these online events to be 100. And so that way, we can then see how engaged they are based on their behaviour and the average engagement rate of everyone who was coming onto our webinars and participating and downloading content ended up being 152. Um, so really important to start thinking of it as a whole, if that makes sense, and thinking about new ways that you can attract different members, yep. new ways that you can even engage current um, people who are involved in your community as well. Um, and I think lead generation is a perfect way to do that. Like I said, not only to generate new revenue into your organization, but to also, um, from the retention side of things and to keep people engaged, I think it's great.
Nice. There's always so many different opinions when it comes to charging for events. What's mm. your opinion on this, and what are we starting to see trend-wise? Okay, so if we go into paid versus free events now, so like I just said, when you're running lead generation events, it's really important to have them for free, but we are seeing more and more people charge for their online events. Um, people are actually quite scared to, I find, yeah. unless it's compulsory professional development, but here's what we saw last year here at Redback from our customers. Um, so in terms of attendance rates, if you're offering a free event, we saw attendance rates drop by 30 to 40%. Yes. So um, that means that for every 100 people you have that register for your webinar, you're probably only going to get around 40 to 50 of them online. That was one of the trends that we saw, but not necessarily a bad thing because you can still actually reach out to those people attending afterwards. Yes. Um, but uh, however, if you charge for an event, the attendance rate was around the 80 to 90% mark. So okay. you've got a higher chance of people attending your event in the live environment if you pay for, if you charge for that. We saw the ratio, however, free versus paid, 65 to 35, which is quite a significant change because in 2015, in 2013, sorry, uh, we only had probably 10 to 15 percent of our customers charging for events. So we had more of them start to think, okay, what are some ways that we can actually make some additional revenue here, um, and can it actually work? But I think the biggest thing that came out of it was a 30% increase in the blended model. So what that meant is people offering a blended solution of paid and free events. So for professional development or even just membership engagement, people started offering events. Some of them were free, some of them were paid, but then some of them also started to change their model and say, okay, I'm going to give um, free webinars and free webcasts to our members, but I'm going to charge for non-members because yep. that might be a way to actually get new members on board. So a few different options there with free versus paid, um, but very important to consider the organisation that you're in, considering the people that you want to target as well. Nice. And I think this is just some paid events, as I was saying then. Um, obviously, there's extra revenue opportunities mm -hmm. when it comes into that. Um, you get an increase of in attendance with people online. People tend to be a little bit more engaged when they're online as well in a live environment if they're paid for it because they know, okay, I've invested this much in it. I want to actually get something from it. Um, and sometimes they can be considered a little bit more credible as well. And I think. I don't know about everyone else out there, but I get invitations to a lot of webinars because I sign up to a lot of things, um, and a lot of the times they're they're free and you know they're just I'm getting bombarded by them a lot of the time. Um, so it's really the presenter and the subject matter that stands out. But if it's a paid event, I tend to pay a little bit more attention because I think it's of more value, and I think oh wait a minute this might be really important, and yeah. so it all of a sudden seems a little bit more credible. Um, However, with paid events, you might get a lower registration rate as well, which might not necessarily be good for your sponsors if you have got sponsors involved. Um, but then you've also got the administ administration things to worry about. So if you are going to charge for events, do you have an e-commerce platform? Um, can you make it as easy as possible? Um, and can this obviously work in with your webinar provider? I think it's also good to say there because a lot of people get really scared off by with the free events that decrease in live attendance. Mm. But you generally, the people that you get are the right people. Yeah. But the people you want on it anyway. And the exact same thing with people going, oh, I've got decreased registrations for paid events. Like, well, no, you've got people paying who actually want to see the content. Yeah. I think more and more people, I think, you know, webinars just came in full force with everyone. And I think yep. now webcasts are coming in full force and people got so excited and they wanted to run it and then they saw excellent results. But then as, you know, things started to drop down and get back to reality, people start to get a little bit disheartened. But it's like you're still attracting those people who want to be there. And do you really, I think it's, you know, um, quality over yes. quantity at the end of the day, as with anything. Um, but if you are considering charging for your events, um, obviously you want to make as much money as possible, which is where you know you could have a paid event that has sponsors to it, which means you're making every, every um, so much more money. And then you could be nurturing those people afterwards, which could lead to lead generation. So yep. it's like what I said at the beginning: um, all of this can sort of all be you know combined into one big really. Um, amazing online event marketing strategy if you really wanted to and if you want to put a little bit of effort into it. Nice. 
Um, but then we've got free events as well. So obviously here um, it's the opposite is what we just spoke about. So you do have those high registration rates and you can attract a wider audience. And like I said, it is perfect for lead generation activities. Um, however, your attendance rates may start to drop a little bit and it is becoming a saturated market. So you know, then it goes back to considering, do you want to maybe offer a webcast as well as a webinar to make it a little bit more exciting for people yep. and to change things up a bit? Um, and I think you know, if you do have a webinar program or an online event program, considering the different ways that you can engage people and keeping it different every time, um, even doing like shorter segments. We've got customers and partners now doing 15 minute webinars because they just want to do a quick interview and they think, you know, I don't want to sit online for an actual entire hour and I don't need to because I can just get as much information out of 15 minutes. Um, so a few different options there and I think a lot for people to think about for 2015. I really like that model, the 15 minute interview ones. I think it's going to start to trend. Yeah, it's going to okay. change the world, Michael. It's going to change the world. <laughs> okay, so what are your tips for paid events? Okay. How can we make money? Um, well, obviously, if people are paying for something, they want value and they're going to be a lot more inclined to give you negative feedback if they're paid for it and they're not happy. So you want to make sure that you've got highly skilled presenters with excellent technical knowledge. Um, a lot of people who charge for events make sure that, you know, I think if you're um, hopping online, I think we saw this last year, a lot of our customers within the um, financial industries and the legal industries and stuff like that, they tend to charge for their events mm -hmm. a lot more than some other organisations. So thinking about your industry and what people are willing to charge and even, you know, are you, are you you marketing to an individual, a not-for-profit, or a corporate, and who is going to be more willing to pay for an event? You know, if you're marketing to uni students, maybe they're not going to be willing to pay for your event because they don't have as much income as, say, someone who's just completed, you know, their CPA or something like that. Yes. Um, your presenter as well, and there's a thing called CREED. Um, so CREED actually stands for credentials, reputation, expertise. Experience and dynamism. Dynamism, sorry. So think about presenter training as well when it comes to this. Um, and if you've got a presenter who's international and you can stream in from maybe the US or something like that, that's going to be a little bit more appealing to some people depending on your industry. Um, and making sure that they are trained up when they're ready to get online and understanding that you know presenting online can be a little bit different. Um, compulsory as well. A lot of people offer paid uh, or charge for events when it is compulsory CPD because more people are likely to pay because they, they have, have to. to. <laughs> um, and then when it comes to how much do you charge as well, I think I think it depends on the, the content, the audience and the industry. Um, so we've had people charge from say $20 to $25 for an online event and then we've had some people pay up to $350 for a 90 minute event um, and it really is how big is a piece of string but I think you need to think about your audience and that time is money as well so how much time are they investing, when are you going to offer this to them to watch, how much are you going to charge them and what value are you going to give them afterwards as well um, and I think the perfect way to do this is you know your audience better than anyone else so ask them. Send them you know, an email at the beginning before you launch your series and say, hey guys, we're thinking of running this webinar series and don't blatantly ask how much would you pay because obviously everyone's going to you know, yeah. choose the less one. Um, but find ways that you can sort of get everyone involved and get their input into these sort of programs um, and then tailor your program around that as well. Consider a program, like I just said, um, and make it interactive and consider post events. So with a lot of these, a lot of people just assume they're going to attend a live webinar and pay for it and it's done, um, make sure you let them know that they're going to have access to this content maybe six to 12 months after it's done if it's relevant as well and that's a huge advantage for people because people are busy and people forget and people want to be able to access things when they want it on their own time. So I think it's really important that you guys um, consider, I, well I don't think anyone does it enough to be honest, yep. really make it a big point of the on-demand content and I think as webinars and webcasts become more prominent and I think as people become more time poor, it's just going to be more important that we focus on on-demand content and consider it just as important as the live element of an event. And just to tie back in sponsorship to this whole thing, again, remembering that that on-demand content can be sponsored mm -hmm. and it can even be a different sponsor from the live event. Yeah. You can change your sponsorship in your when getting sponsorship for it. You can have one person sponsor the live event and then you can sell the sponsorship for the on-demand as a complete separate package. You can make double the amount of money. You can. Get money Maybe. out of everyone. So. Um, so I think these are really the five 
things that I wanted to... These are your top tips. Yeah, yeah, to take away. And I think it's important when you attend these events to walk away just, you know, even knowing one or two things that have been like a light bulb moment to you. So, and I think this comes back to every single presentation we do on online events is to know what your goals are from the beginning and what you want to achieve. Um, you know, coming into this, many of you may not have thought that there was more than one way to make money from an online event. Many of you may have just thought it was just sponsorship and that was your only option. Whereas now you've seen three different options. So it's really important to know what you want to achieve is it going to be increased member engagement? Is it going to be more revenue directly hitting the bottom line? Um, or is it going to be you know, more members coming on board and people signing up to your community? Maybe that's how you're going to measure your return on investment. Maybe it's not all about actual hard money. Yeah. Maybe it's about you know, what's going to come into your organization six to 12 months down the track. Um, who your audience is, because every audience is different and I think it's important that you gain as much feedback from your audience beforehand and then keep that feedback loop going as you continue your managed event program. And utilise all your touch points as well. So it's not just about your email communication, it's about your submit pages, it's about your on-demand hosting pages afterwards and making sure you have a clear strategy before, during and after your event and then also making sure you communicate that to people. And measure to improve, you know, measuring your conversion rates um, and knowing, I think you don't know what you don't know. So if you're not measuring, you know, and you don't know what's working because you have no way to measure it, you need to find a way. Um, and utilising the data that you have and measuring behaviour and engagement, I think is going to become much more common um, as online events become much more common, um, especially within Australia. And then nurture and build a community. So even if you aren't doing something, like this and you're not ready to make money from online events, I think you still need to nurture your community and find a way to build upon that community with your online events. Um, you know, even people say to us, oh, I don't want the chat box open in my webinar because I want it to be private, which is fair enough. But then we've got some people, they say, do you know what? We have the same people hop into every single webinar once a month and they all get, they all start to know each other and it builds an online community and they want to talk to each other and it makes it feel more human and it removes that technology barrier. So think about stuff like that when it comes to your community as well. I think um, that's all really important. It's not just all, obviously making money is great, yeah. but it's about a little bit more than that. And with a measure to improve and the building a community and everything, as we said before, you can do this stuff manually, but there are products out there. Um, so just think about that when you're trying to discover where to move on forward. So, okay, just going to open up both tabs now just so you guys can see us again. And we're going to pull up our exit survey on the right-hand side just so you can ask us feedback while we go into the end. So the slide we have up right now is just over to you. So we made this an interactive slide. So you can click on each one of these you can download and find out information about becoming a presenter. You can support our charities. So that's one of the ways of interacting with the slides. So just have a click on that. Um, and also, if you can, please provide us any feedback in the right-hand side. Um, so if there's any questions now, please feel free to type them through to me and Sarah. We're happy to answer any ones that you have on sponsorship, lead generation. Fire away. But any final notes from you, Sarah? Yes. Yeah, like I said, there's some more content available um, in the download more content section there. There's actually a white paper which actually gives you some information um, on hosting your hybrid events and some on online hosting platforms, even some free online hosting platforms that you guys can actually get your hands on if you wanted to as well. Um, and then also more tips on marketing your events and getting the most for them. Um, but please fill out the survey. Um, your feedback is obviously really important to us. And, you know, this is the beginning of our webinar series. So yes. thank you for joining. Um, if you are a presenter and you've got something to share, we're more than happy to speak to you guys about becoming a presenter. So feel free to click on that link, um, become a presenter. 
and let us know um, or perhaps you know someone who would be great as well. Like I said, we're always willing to share as much knowledge as possible. Um, and I can't see any more questions coming through now, um, but if anyone does have any questions post-event, please let me know. Um, we'll be sending out a recording within 48 hours, which will have our direct details on there, a copy of the slides as well as some other supporting documentation. Um, but other than that, I'd like to thank you all for joining. I'd like to thank Michael for being a wonderful host thank and I'd like to thank Yanine for taking care of all the technology and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining our Business Goals webinar series. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.